Okay, assalamu alaikum once again. Another day. Socialist Studies, History, Chapter 2. Gasnavid Rule from 962, 962 to 1186 Common Era. Okay, so that is today's lesson topic. beginning of the lesson now first and for, uh, foremost the most important points in these lessons are who founded the Ghaznavid rule and who is or who was Alaptagin who was Sabuktagin and how did they manage to come here in the so how did they expand their territory okay now Raptagin is the founder he is the founder of Ghaznavid rule and Sabuknagin is his son-in-law the names are quite difficult for me my tongue are twisted twisting okay now we know that uh, according to your book Sabuknagin it was a Turkish slave and uh, Alaptagin was a Turkish commander in the Persian army. It was in 962 CE. Okay. And then uh, Alaptagin here succeeded his father and he became the governor of Ghazni. Clear? And Ghazni is located in Afghanistan. Now, some of the characteristics of uh, Alaptagin are he was a brave leader, obviously, and he managed to control the fort of Ghazni with a small but well-trained army. Okay? He continued to rule independently until his death in nine, 976 CE. After his death, Alaptagin's death, his son-in-law, a former slave, Sabuktagin, took over the reign. So he became the governor of Ghazni during that time. And obviously, a leader should have the quality of being brave, and but he's a competent leader as well. Brave, Sabuktagin was a competent and a brave leader. And Ghazni became a strong Muslim state under his rule. Okay. Now, obviously, because our leader here is a competent one and a brave one, he will have a lot of enemies. And during his tenure, the neighboring Hindu kingdom began to feel threatened. Okay. And... They rose up against the Turks, but Sabuktagin managed to defeat all attacks by the allied kingdoms and extended the boundaries of his empire. Because he's a competent leader, he managed to win. Okay? Sabuktagin, although was a slave, a former slave, was remembered as the first Muslim to enter the subcontinent from the north. But unfortunately, everybody died and he died in the year 907, 997 CE and he left his kingdom to Mahmud. What do we know about Mahmud of Ghazni? Let's take a look. As written in the slide, most powerful ruler of his time. He was born in 997. I'm sorry, he was not born in 997. He started 
his career as a leader in 997. And his main adversary. Main adversary ka matlab hai? Opponent. Ananpal, the son of Jaipal of Shahi dynasty. And he was the one who burned the Somnath temple. Now let's take a look deeper about Mehmud of Ghazni. Mehmud of Ghazni or Sultan Mehmud Ghaznavi was one of the most powerful rulers of his time. His inher he inherited empire included areas of Bukhara, the Persian Gulf, Khwarezm, Tehran, and India. It was, it's a, such a large area. Along with his father's kingdom, Mehmud also inherited troubles created by the local Rajas. Okay? Life is not a bed of roses. Now, when he was uh, when he was the leader, his opponent or adversary was Ananpal, the son of the twice defeated King Jaipal of the Shahi dynasty in northern Punjab. Ananpal did not accept Mahmud as ruler and refused to pay tribute to him. He wanted. Why? Why does he? Why he doesn't want to pay uh, pay tribute? Because he wanted to take revenge. Dear the father, his father died in his hand. That is the reason why he wanted to take revenge for his father's defeat at Sabuktagin's hands. Okay, so he invited other rajas to become his allies or allies and launch a uh, campaign against. Mood. But unfortunately, we know that uh, Mahmud was a strong leader and he was uh, the most powerful ruler of his time. And obviously, they defeated Ananpal and his allied forces at Lahore in 1008 CE. Okay? However, Ananpal did not give up hostilities and continued to provoke Mahmud into skirmishes. His successor did the same, but Mahmud dealt with them equally well and obviously again defeated them all. Mahmud here continued to raid other Indian territories and returned victorious after each attack laden with booty and slaves by 1024 ce mahmud controlled a large part of the subcontinent and most of iran and afghanistan okay 17 raids from 1000 ce to 1025 ce just imagine that one and Mahmud's most famous campaign was the capture of the Somnath Temple. This huge temple of Kat at Katyawar was decided dedicated. Sorry, this huge temple at Katyawar was dedicated to the great Hindu god Shiva. They celebrated all major festivals there with great reverence. The temple was also famous for the great wealth that pilgrims brought as offerings to their God. Mahmud decided to attack Katiawar. With help from his allies, he marched to Katiawar and on his way, he captured many forts and displaced many Rajas. He destroyed the temple in 1024 CE broke all the idols in the temples and carried away its wealth and treasures to Ghazni. Okay, as I've said earlier, 17 raids from 1000 CE to 1025 on the subcontinent. But unfortunately, he doesn't stay in one place <laughs> to strengthen his rule. 
After conquering a place, Mahmud usually allowed the Hindu population to practice its own. Well, what's a, what, what a competent and good leader? Religion and retained local Hindu officials. So what do you want more? To help and in administration. Okay. He, he also had Indian troops and commanders in his army. He always carried treasures and artisans back to his hometown and Disney became the most remarkable city of its time. Okay. Hello again. After this one, you're going to watch the video about the history of Mahmud of Ghazni. After that, we're going to uh, answers. The question and answers already written in the slides. You will just copy them. And then uh, I will give you homework later on. Okay? But uh, first, copy everything. Okay, watch the video and learn, okay, about the history of Mahmud of Ghazni. The Abbasid Caliphate began to weaken as a centralized political entity from the mid-9th century onwards, with the core of the empire in Baghdad slowly losing its grip on the periphery. One of the local dynasties that rose to power in this void was that of the Samanids. Supposedly descended from the great Sassanid hero, Bahram Chobin, its first member was an 8th century Persian noble called Saman Kuda, who converted from Zoroastrianism to Islam in the 720s. After helping Caliph al Mamun's governor in Khurasan in quelling a rebellion in 819, Kuda's four grandsons were each rewarded with dominion over a city in Central Asia, a region which would serve as the Samanid center of power in the future. Nur was granted the city of Samarkand, Yaya was appointed to govern Tashkent, Ilyas was stationed in Herat, and perhaps most importantly, Ahmad was sent to Fergana. All four of these men ruled small, feudal-like kingdoms in the region until around 892, when Ahmad's son, Ismail ibn Ahmad, conquered northern Iran, defeated the Afghanids and Safarids, and unified the scattered Samanid princedoms into a single emirate under nominal Abbasid suzerainty. Ismail then shifted his capital to the caravan city of Bukhara. Due to the proximity of the Great Steppe, Samanid rulers inherited the ancestral duty of keeping the nomads at bay by launching military campaigns into the region and defending Islam's frontiers. In 893, Ismail launched a great expedition to the north and conquered Tanis, capital of the Kalak Turks, carrying off a grand haul of loot and slaves in the process. This was supplemented by continuous smaller-scale military activity on the Samanid frontier, as their warriors would go across the border and raid the steppes. As a result of this, a steady trickle of Turkic slaves from the nomadic tribes came into the Abbasid Caliphate. However, by the late 10th century, the Samanids were already on the decline. To defend itself, armies of the Samanid realm had become increasingly reliant on Turkic slave soldiers. These former nomads had been used for civilian and court roles, such as pages and chamberlains, during most of the emirate's history. But the phenomenon of Turkic slave soldiers, known otherwise as Mamluks or Gulans, became vastly more common as Samanid history progressed. This process of increasing reliance might rightly be paralleled with the contemporary rise of mercenary use in the Byzantine Empire, or the even earlier employment of Germanic auxiliaries in Imperial Roman armies. As in the case of notable Germanic generals in the Roman army, such as Ricimer and Stilicho, Turkic slave soldiers could also become incredibly prominent in the Islamic world, wielding enormous military and political power. With that said, we can introduce our main character. Abu Mansur Sabuktigin was a boy born of Turkic stock around 942 probably in the eastern regions of modern Kyrgyzstan. The ruler of his birthplace of Baskan was supposedly a Kaluk Turk, so it is possible that Sabuktigin himself also had Kaluk ancestry, but this is far from certain. 
His enslavement as a youth was a textbook example of how such things often happened on the Central Asian steppe during, before, and after this time period, probably a microcosm of how the majority of slaves were sold into the Caliphate. Constant warfare and smaller-scale marauding were always ongoing between different nomadic tribes over land, women, and prestige, and it was in one of these raids that a young Sabuktigin was captured by the rival Bactian tribe and sent to a slave market in Tashkent. Whilst for sale in this Silk Road oasis town, the boy was seen by an enterprising merchant called Nusso Haji and purchased as a slave. Slavery is always a horrific practice, but in the Caliphate, it did not necessarily have identical connotations of unfair, backbreaking labor and non-advancement that it does to us today. Instead, Sabuktigin was taken to a school in the city of Nekshav, probably with many others like him. There, he was trained extensively and groomed to become an elite warrior. The curriculum was probably made up of military tactics and equestrian arts, command, combat with different types of weaponry, cavalry warfare, and many other necessary practices. After this period of intensive training, Sabuktigin, now a warrior, was transported to the city of Nishapur. There, he managed to catch the eye of a fellow Turkic slave soldier, but one who had risen to a far higher rank. This was a man named Alptigin, who subsequently purchased Sabuktigin for service in his guard. As a mere slave himself, Sabuktigin's new master was perhaps the best role model for a young Gulam, the perfect example of what a successful slave soldier could become given time, skill, and fierce loyalty. After being captured as a child, Alptigin had risen through the ranks of Noah I's elite emir's bodyguard, consisting of Gulam. For years of loyal service, he was then appointed to administer the city of Balkh by Noah's successor, Abd al-Malik I. This was perhaps the wealthiest Silk Road trading city at the time, which demonstrates the extraordinary trust placed in him by the emir. After his integration into Alptigin's Gulam, Sabuktigin showcased skill, prowess, and reliability in his master's service, rising more rapidly than was usual for Turks in the personal guard of Samanid governors. We don't know, but it's possible that the governor saw something of himself in the younger man. By the age of 18, Sabuktigin was trusted to command a unit of 200 other Gulam warriors. By 961, Alptigin had risen to the lofty status of Commander-in-Chief of all Samanid armies in Khurasan, undoubtedly the Emirate's largest and most crucial province. This also gave him unprecedented levels of control over the Samanid government, as Abd al-Malik couldn't even make decisions without consent from the Turkic military establishment in Khurasan. However, Abd al-Malik's untimely death at the end of 961 flipped the table completely and changed the future for Sabuktigin and his powerful master. Alptigin attempted to play kingmaker, supporting the late emir's son in his attempt to inherit supreme power. However, a more influential political faction, led by a courtier named Faik, supported Abd al-Malik's brother, Manso. It quickly became clear that Alptigin wouldn't be winning this round of political maneuvering, and, fearing that his dominant position in the Samanid realm would be undermined by the potentially hostile successor, he escaped east from Nishapur with a small army of Gulam, numbering a few thousand men. On his march, Alptigin subdued an Iranian ruler in Bamiyan, and then defeated the army of a Hindu Shahi king in Kabul. He then pushed south, eventually arriving at a relatively insignificant city known as Ghazna. After a grueling four-month siege, Alptigin took possession of the city from the Samanid vassal Lawik and set up there. If he had conquered a city in the emirate's core, Alptigin would have been swiftly crushed, but Ghazna was a backwater settlement on the very edge of Samanid authority. However, there is evidence that a military expedition was sent against Alptigin, then soundly defeated outside Ghazna's gates, possibly led or sent by Faik. Alptigin finally passed away in 963, and was succeeded by his son, Abu Ishaq Ibrahim, who also inherited his slaves. 
This short rule didn't begin well, because the previously deposed Lawig came and reconquered the city briefly. Ishak and Sabuktigin then fled to Bukhara and pledged allegiance to Mansur in return for aid. Sabuktigin supposedly impressed the Samanid court with his intelligence, judgment and piety. In 965, Ishak returned to Ghazna with Samanid military units at his back and managed to reconquer the city, but then he died in 966. The now free Turkic warriors in Ghazna chose a chain of their Gulam commanders to rule the city for the next 11 years, during which time Sabuktigin slowly gained more and more authority. It is said that he would win other army chiefs to his side by hosting luxurious feasts for them twice a week. In 977, Sabuktigin managed to repel another attempt by Lawik to return, and then used his victory to become governor of the city himself. Seeking to use the legacy of Alptigin to gain legitimacy and secure his position, Sabuktigin then married his former master's daughter. The young Kaluk boy, who had been taken from his home on the steppe as a child, had now made a life for himself. Military expansion also began almost immediately after Sabuktigin took power in 977. A dispute between two Safarid Gulam leaders, Tokam and Betuz, gave him the pretext that he needed to intervene, capturing Kandahar and the surrounding regions for his new Ghaznavid empire. He undertook administrative reforms in order to tune up the old system of military fiefs, which had been introduced to Ghazna by the Turkic troops under Alptigin. The mixture of Persian bureaucrats and Indian governmental techniques that had been previously used to run the region were kept in place. Despite essentially being an autonomous ruler, detached from the central structure of Samanid power, Sabuktigin continued to present himself as a governor for the Emir in Bukhara. We can see this because coins minted in the rulership of Sabuktigin bear the name of the Samanid Emir more prominently than his own name. Taking this subordinate role seriously, the faithful Ghaznavid governor and his eldest son, Mahmud of Ghazna, marched to help Amir Nur II put down a rebellion in Khurasan during 993. They succeeded by August of 994, managed to execute the rebel ringleaders, and were rewarded appropriately. Sabuktigin was made the official governor of Balkh, Tokharistan, Bamiyan, Gore, and Garchistan, and was given the prestigious honorific Nazir al-Din, Defender of the Faith. Mahmud was given command of all the Emir's armies in Khurasan, the richest of all Samanid provinces. Still, the Samanids were now in terminal decline, and began to lose vast amounts of territory, either seized outright in Transoxiana by the encroaching nomadic Karakhanids, or annexed by their Ghaznavid governors in Khurasan and south of the Oxus River. Both Emir Nur II and Sabuktigin passed away in mid-997, the latter after falling gravely ill while campaigning near Balkh at the age of 55. The inheritance of his realm was intended to be split between many of the late ruler's relatives, most prominently his son Mahmud, who was in his provincial capital at Nishapur, and Ismail, a younger son who was the son of Sabuktigin with Alptigin's daughter. This prestigious parentage led Sabuktigin to appoint Ismail as governor of Ghazna and Balk upon his death. However, Ismail was inexperienced when compared to his elder brother, and it was clear that the arrangement could never last. In 998, Mahmud of Ghazna marched from Khurasan to Ghazna, deposed his brother, and secured personal control over all his late father's lands. The Rump Sassanid attempted to send a governor into Nishapur to take back control of Khurasan from Mahmud. The ambitious new ruler was furious at this stab in the back, and when he had finished mopping up his rivals, marched back into his appointed province and seized it for the Ghaznavid Empire. Mahmud did not respect the Samanid's symbolic authority over him as much as Sabuktigin had done, but nevertheless used the pretext of a palace coup in Bukhara to pose as an avenger of the final deposed Amir and crushed his enemies. Representing the ailing dynasty in this self-interested way led to an even greater honor when in 999, 
Khalif al-Qadir granted Mahmud an illustrious title which he is still known by today, Yamin al-Dawla, or the right hand of the state. He was now Sultan, the Caliph's protector and representative to whom the Ghaznavids owed symbolic fealty. Sultan Mahmud's first concern was his affluent, flourishing province of Khurasan. Its fertile agriculture, extensive trade connections, and expert craft production would provide material for the campaigns Mahmud would embark upon. Naturally, Mahmud had to protect his frontier on the Oxus from the equally predatory Karakhanids. To do this, he initially entered a diplomatic marriage with the daughter of Ilig Nasser, the chief who had conquered Samanid Transoxiana. However, the decentralized tribal Karakhanid confederacy meant that little central authority existed and the various Karakhans continued to hungrily eye Khurasan. They invaded the region twice, in 1006 and 1008. During the first war, two nomadic armies launched a pincer maneuver on Ghaznavid territories and managed to capture Nishapur and Balkh, but Mahmud managed to doggedly throw his enemy back across the Oxus. The invasion of 1008 came to an end with a final victory for Ghaznavid arms outside Balk, which finally ended the Karakhanids' southern ambitions. During this battle, a massed charge of the Sultan's armoured Indian elephants demoralised and broke the nomadic forces. The Karakhanids subsequently entered a period of internal strife, never to threaten Khurasan again. The Ghaznavids then asserted dominion over the distant regions which had only been peripherally controlled by the Samanids, such as Sistan, Gajistan, Juzjan, Tokharistan, Qatal, and especially Khwarezm. This strategically placed oasis was another prospering nexus of trade, and an agricultural paradise located on the western flank of the Karakhanid Khanate. In order to seize it, Mahmud used a shrewd ploy. The Sultan married his sister to a brother of the reigning Khwarezmian Amir, and then demanded recognition of Ghaznavid sovereignty in the Oasis realm. This deliberately provoked a violent local reaction. Mahmud's new brother-in-law was killed, giving the Sultan a pretext to intervene and annex the province. The most famous, or infamous, of Mahmud's military actions were the various expeditions he launched into India. Almost every single winter, the great conqueror would gather armies of regular troops at the increasingly prosperous city of Ghazna, supplemented by warriors who flocked from all corners of the Islamic world. All in all, Ghaznavid armies invaded Indian land 17 times during Mahmud's reign, carrying off loot and slaves, destroying Hindu temples, and massacring populations. The climax of the campaigns was in 1025, when Mahmud led his Muslim army across the barren, inhospitable Tar Desert, and then onto the Kativar Peninsula, aiming straight for the Grand Temple Complex at Somnath. Contained within was a gilded statue of the Hindu Mahadeva, or Great God, Shiva, which was served by 1,000 Brahmins, 350 entertainers, and the revenue from 10,000 villages. The Sultan plundered his way through Gujarat, hacking his way through Somnath's Hindu defenders, and the temple was seized. Precious stones and gems stored there were looted, its worshippers were slaughtered, and the structure was torched. It is said that Mahmud of Ghazna personally smashed the gilded statue of Shiva into pieces, and then carried the shards back to his capital, where he incorporated the shattered fragments into the steps of Ghazna's Friday Mosque. For this, he was known forever after as Mahmud, the Idol Breaker. Plunder from the raid exceeded a blistering 2 million dinars, while the number of slain supposedly exceeded 50,000. News of the Sultan's victory at Somnat spread like wildfire through the Islamic world, and to reward him, more honorific titles were sent from Baghdad by the Caliph. However, other Turkic conquerors, the Seljuks, were just around the corner.
Sun.